I had never heard of Nellie Bly, or maybe, <laughs> I mean, it was one of those. You know, I've been working on this book for about four years, and over that time, I would mention to people that I was writing a book about Nellie Bly, and they would say, oh, Nellie Bly, wait, who, who is Nellie Bly again? You know, very often, especially, you know, in, in America, particularly in New York, where I live, people often have read a book about her in fourth grade or fifth grade, one of these, these, these books meant to present plucky female role models for young people. Uh, but as the years go by, they don't quite remember. Was she a journalist? Was she a Civil War nurse? You know, was she a suffragette? You know, or a worker on the Underground Railroad? You know, people don't quite remember who she was. And that was actually true of, of me as well. I knew she was a journalist, but I didn't know much about her. And then I, when I was looking for another book topic, I kind of stumbled across a reference to her. And I investigated, and I found out that she was indeed a journalist, but she was really an amazing journalist. She was a, a female journalist unlike any that New York had yet seen. This is in the 1880s. She was an investigative reporter for Joseph Pulitzer's newspaper, The World. Um, this is at a time when most women were relegated to writing for the women's page. She was going undercover uh, to, to uh, expose so social injustice. Her first one was a really risky one. Her first one was really quite amazing, and I think it points out the courage that she, that she had. She feigned madness. She pretended to be insane in order to get herself committed to uh, the Blackwell's Island Lunatic Asylum for women so that she could experience firsthand the really horrible conditions endured by the, the female patients there. And she got herself in, uh, not knowing if she would ever be able to get, get out. It really took all of Pulitzer's doing to get her back out. Um, but then she did, after 10 days, get out, and she wrote a, uh, an expose that, that uh, led to a reform of the conditions in the asylum. But, so that was one, one example. But, you know, she pretended to be a mother so that she could see if she could sell a baby on the black market. She uh, went to a medical dispensary for poor people where she had her, almost had her perfectly healthy tonsils removed. She was really quite fearless. Uh, but then in the fall of 1889, she undertook her most audacious adventure yet, which was her plan to go around the world faster than anybody had ever done it before, to try to beat in real life the mark of 80 days set by Phileas Fogg and Jules Verne's uh, novel Around the World in 80 Days. And when I discovered that, uh, I knew immediately that, that was the book that I, uh, that I wanted to write. And then there's this second one, <laughs> right. Elizabeth Bislin. Astonishingly, that Nellie Bly wasn't only racing against the calendar or racing against this fictional character, that in fact, on the very same day, November 14th, 1889, another young female journalist had left New York heading in the opposite direction to try to beat Nellie Bly. And I was captivated by the notion of these two young female journalists, one heading east, one heading west, trying to race each other around the world. And then as it turned out, to my great wonder and great good fortune, Elizabeth Bislin turned out to be an equally compelling and remarkable figure in her own right. Nellie is not aware that she's in a race. That's right. They were actually sending reports of their progress back by telegram, which was the kind of great, wondrous new invention of the time, kind of the internet of its time. You know, the notion that you could be in Hong Kong or Ceylon and send a, a message back to New York that would get there in five minutes, really, it blew people's minds. You know, up to that point, it had been, you know, you had to write a letter and wait for it to take weeks to go by steamship. Uh, but as you, as you point out, Nellie Bly did not know about Elizabeth Bisland until she got to Hong Kong as far as she had gone much of the way already, at which point she was in the Hong Kong uh, travel agent's office, and he said, uh, you're going to lose. And she said, no, I, I'm ahead of my schedule. I don't think I'm going to lose. And he said, the other woman is going to beat you. She was already here a few days ago. And Nellie Bly said, what other woman? And that's when she first discovered that, in fact, there was this other woman who was racing her around the world. Nellie Bly was none too pleased to discover that somebody was trying to beat her. She was very competitive, Nellie Bly. And this is interesting, too. You know, for Nellie Bly, it was always a race. She was desperate to win. Um, she said several times that she would rather die than return to New York behind time. She was constantly worrying about deadlines and ship schedules and telling the, ca the ship's captains, more steam, more steam. I mean, she, you know, if it was up to her, she would have spent no time in any of these, these places, you know, these exotic places. She just wanted to go as fast as she possibly could. For Elizabeth Bisland, 
Uh, she was certainly trying to win, but for her it was really an opportunity to see the world. She had never been outside the country before, and she discovered very quickly that she had this love of travel. She had this love of the Far East. She ended up going back to the Far East a couple of times later in her life to revisit the places that she had seen first on this race around the world. And then she wrote a book about, about the trip later called A Flying Trip Around the World, in which remarkably she never once referred to it as a race. She always referred to it as a trip or as a journey. Um, so, so they had a really a very different attitude about, uh, about this. I'd be cheering for Nellie, and then I'd read an Elizabeth chapter, and I was like, oh, Nellie's a little coarse. <laughs> Elizabeth is, is much more, I like, and then it would switch back, and it was like, well, but Nellie's plucky, and because it was her idea a year before to That's go. That's right. It had been her idea, and she had to fight to, to allow them to do it. You know, this was a time when male newspaper editors didn't allow their female reporters to go across the city, much less go around the world by themselves. Unescorted. That's right. And, uh, and it was only because the, the world circulation began to dip that they finally allowed her to do this. But, um, you know, your response was exactly what I wanted, you know, that I, I, I alternated chapters between the Nellie Bly point of view and the Elizabeth Bislin point of view. Um, and, you know, I really thought of them both as, as remarkable, complicated, difficult women in certain ways, very admirable in other ways. And, you know, it's been wonderful to me to hear readers say, oh, I was rooting for Nellie Bly. Oh, I was rooting for Elizabeth Bislin. Because they each had qualities that, that, that that someone can respond to. The epilogue was for me one of the my favorite parts of the book because they had such fascinating lives after the race as well. The book is 80 Days, Nellie Bly and Elizabeth Bislin's History-Making Race Around the World. I've been speaking with the author Matthew Goodman and 80 Days, published by Ballantine Books.